What I want to do now is respond to some of the common objections to the argument from hell. And uh, one of the most common apologetic acrobatics is the idea that hell is not really torture. And this is where the apologist will try and whitewash hell in order to make it seem as though eternal conscious torture isn't all that bad. Now, first, let's take a look at how the Christian Bible, specifically the New Testament and Jesus, describe hell. It is everlasting fire, unquenchable fire, a place where the worms that eat them do not die and the fire is not quenched, a place of torments and flame, everlasting destruction, a place of torment with fire and brimstone where the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever, a lake of fire and brimstone where the wicked are tormented day and night forever and ever. And finally, Jesus himself indicates that the punishment in hell is everlasting, not merely the smoke and the flames. And I've got verses right there for you to go look it all up. Tell me how that could be taken out of context. Please, I'd love to hear it. Now, I'm really not sure how you can read these descriptions and also accept that, you know, you accept the idea that whatever hell is, it will go on for eternity and you can conclude that it is not some form of eternal conscious torture. I think it's pretty safe to say that when you're in a situation where the only thoughts you have are make the pain stop or kill me, you can call what's going on torture. Now I'm sure this is the point where there are plenty of Christians who are out there screaming the word metaphor as loudly as they can when these verses are pointed out. Some may have even, uh, con- you know, Condescend, you know, condescended to us with questions like, you don't think it really means that there's an actual lake of fire, do you? Now, whether or not hell is, an, is a place of actual eternal burning torture, or if it's some other kind of punishment, is immaterial to my argument. It's worth pointing out that in years gone by, the fire pit is exactly what most Christians thought hell was. But things have softened up a bit in recent years. Now we get ideas from C.S. Lewis or serious theologians like N.T. Wright who describe hell as more of an eternal separation from God, where the individual in hell is no longer human because they no longer bear the image of God. These views on hell are more reminiscent of, say, a Dementor's Kiss from Harry Potter than the classical versions of Dante's Inferno. This, however, is a mental torture. It's like isolation, sleep deprivation, and sensory deprivation. That's still torture. And I'm sorry, you can't whitewatch torture. Now, just as an aside, this has to be one of the least justifiable dodges about the nature of hell that's out there. But it's also going to be one of the most prevalent, from my experience, There's one verse that talks about hell as eternal separation from God, 2 Thessalonians 1.9. But even in that verse, it's preceded by the idea that hell is eternal destruction. Compare this with at least six verses describing hell as eternal, and five verses describing hell as a place of fire. I mean, seriously, when describing Lazarus in hell in a parable, Jesus is pretty clear about him being in fire, to the point where he's begging for water to be put on his tongue. But the people in heaven can't do that, because there's a chasm separating them from hell that no one could cross even if they wanted to. The idea that hell is just a separation from God, and that maybe the people in hell would enjoy it there is just an incredible dodge, a convenient reinterpretation for Christians who know they're on the losing side of an argument. But apologists aren't done trying to whitewash the torture of hell. Many will go on about how the gates of hell are locked from the inside, and that people in hell really don't want to be with God, and so are just stuck there of their own accord. Now the issue here is that, in this case, Hell is still a fate worse than non-existence. Even if the gates from hell were locked from within, God is still sustaining the souls in hell, denying them the ability to cease to exist. And that's what's immoral about the situation. The continual infliction of pain where non-existence would be preferable. Now finally, 
I've come across some postmodern style preachers that I know who try to retreat to some form of agnosticism about what hell is really like, claiming that they can't really know what hell is because it's only described to us in literary terms. So it's not fair for an atheist to say that hell is a place where no happiness or relief from torments is available, so that continued existence in hell could very well be preferable to non-existence, and so the argument from hell fails. The issue that I've got here is that these apologists are being inconsistent. One wonders where their epistemic humility goes when they discuss heaven. Would these preachers be willing to sign up for the idea that there may be suffering in heaven, or that some people in heaven may at one point wish for non-existence after growing tired of praising God for countless millennia? There's nothing in the Bible that leaves room for believing that there is any happiness or relief from the torments of hell, just as there isn't anything in the Bible to believe that some people in heaven will eventually be unhappy. Another brief objection I see is the idea that God had no choice in creation. This is a rather silly objection to the argument from hell that tries to deny the idea that God had a choice in whether or not to create angels, humans, and the material universe as though this would absolve him from any wrongdoing in creating hell. Still, some Christians will claim that creating is part of God's necessary nature, so he couldn't refrain from creating all this stuff. Now, First off, that's just amazingly implausible, and lends credence to the idea that God's nature is a convenient dumping ground for all sorts of things that would make the life of an apologist much easier to solve paradoxes in theology. However, the more substantial answer here is that even if God had to create, there's nothing that says he had to create beings that would be immortal, or that he couldn't ju just destroy the souls of those who didn't freely choose to love him, or that he even had to create creatures with free will at all. Further, by claiming God had no choice in creation, an apologist robs God of all agency and free will, to the point where we can add another reason to question why humanity had to be created with free will in the first place. But then it gets worse. The Christian God then becomes no different than a mechanistic or naturalistic force that would just generate universes. This opens up a whole can of theological worms to avoid the issue. But in doing this, the Christian actually implicitly acknowledges that if God had a choice in creating hell, he'd be wrong to create it. Now aside from the idea that hell is not eternal conscious torture, the other broad category of objection that we get to the argument from hell is that we can't have morality without God. Now this kind of objection takes aim at the premise that eternal conscious torture is immoral. But, since most apologists don't want to directly claim that torture must be moral if God does it, they try to attack any atheistic appeal to morality. The issue here is that this is really just a diversionary tactic, hoping to move the debate to the moral argument from the existence of God, and away from the idea that hell is eternal conscious torture, and a loving God really wouldn't do that. Now, the moral argument is its own ball of wax that can be defeated on its own terms, but the point here is that the moral argument doesn't save the Christian from having to deal with the argument from hell because of the stances the Christian must take on the moral argument. Now, the moral argument is an argument that without God, that there is no objective basis for morality. It's not about moral epistemology or, in non-philosopher speak, it's not about how we know what is good and evil. It's about what the basis for good and evil actually is. Now, the issue here is that even if we grant that God is necessary as a basis for morality, even the theist would have to admit that we have moral intuitions. As a matter of fact, the evidence that they use for the moral argument is the fact that we as human beings have moral intuitions that tell us that things are right or wrong. Now, the problem here is that torture, specifically eternal torture without end, violates our basic moral intuitions. It's a horror that's hard to imagine, let alone have it be something that a loving God could knowingly condemn his creations to. I mean, seriously, if you're an American, we have an amendment to our Constitution that forbids this kind of a thing. Are we more moral than God? Now, I really don't grant that we need a God to ground morality. But even if I did, I could still use this argument from hell to show that if a God does exist, and that it does ground our morality, then that God is not Yahweh, the Christian God. You know, 
the whole point of this is that the argument from hell is an argument to convince people that they should not be a Christian, or at least not be a certain kind of Christian. I'm completely upfront about the fact that this isn't an argument that will make you an atheist. It's just here to show you that in Christianity, at least on the Orthodox interpretations, it's internally inconsistent. Finally, there is no justification for the doctrine of hell. I mean, there are a few more laughable objections, like saying hell is a prison that's run by the inmates, and that since God isn't there, hell is only as terrible as the people in hell make it. But any person who made a prison like that that lets inmates do whatever they wanted to other inmates would be arrested for crimes against humanity if they did it on Earth. What does that say about God? The entire problem is that there really is no justification for eternal conscious torture. Even on the most charitable version of hell, we're dealing with a God that literally says, I could have let you cease to exist, but why not let you spend eternity in torment instead? And this is supposed to be the God of love. Seriously. Now I want to conclude with how theists and Christians can escape the argument. I want to make it clear that this argument doesn't apply to all sects of Christianity. In fact, we see some Christian apologists like Randall Rouser and even the more well-known Richard Swinburne adopting views of universalism or some form of annihilationism. Now, as David Silverman pointed out, there are more denominations of Christianity than there are sentences in the Bible. And certainly, any Christian that believes in universalism or in an annihilationist version of hell can escape this argument. Now, I think that those Christians will ultimately come up against problems with picking and choosing which parts of the Bible they want to follow. But, to be fair, the Bible is so contradictory on even this point that universalist Christians can say that Christians who believe in eternal conscious torture version of hell are picking and choosing which parts they want to, you know, interpret as true. That all said, these alternate views on hell exist mainly because the standard Christian interpretations of hell are so abhorrent that the universalist or annihilationist views pretty much accept this argument against the existence of hell which is why they reinterpret their scriptures to get a more moral version of the afterlife. So that's pretty much going to wrap up this video series on hell. Um, if you have some other objections to the argument, I would love to hear them. Put them in the comments sections or head on over to my blog where we can get uh, responses that are a lot longer than 500 characters. Um, and once again, if you've made it this far, thanks for watching.